الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters in this episode of the inner dimensions in respect to the ritual acts of worship I would like to discuss for whom this is intended and when and where is it supposed to be done okay so firstly obviously perhaps this is intended for Muslims because the ritual acts of worship of course acts of worship that are done by Muslims and they are guided by the light of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so obviously how can a person worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly if they are not guided by the Quran and the Sunnah the second thing is that this is in respect to the prescribed acts of worship so we're talking about here the shahada the testimony of faith the salah the zakah the psalm the hajj the five daily prayers that every muslim has to pray the zakah which is the obligatory money that needs to be given to the prescribed people in the quran of course the month of fasting and ramadan and pilgrimage to mecca so these prescribed acts of worship are acts of worship that are done by Muslims and they are done according to the teachings of the Quran and according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so the inner dimension is something that is connected to the Muslim who performs those acts now there may be people who call themselves Muslims you may be interested in this subject but in reality if you are not praying and if you are not giving zakah and if you're not fasting Ramadan and if you're not making Hajj then of what ultimate relevance is this discussion going to be to you so this is for Muslims not only Muslims but Muslims who are acting upon and following and implementing their religion these are the people who are really really going to benefit from so mashallah as long as you fall into that category whether you're a man whether you're a woman whether you're rich whether you're poor whatever category it may be that you are inshallah this is relevant to everybody it's not only relevant it's very very important for you as well how about the age though that's an interesting topic at what age should we start to learn and understand about these inner dimensions of worship of course the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us and instructed us that when our children reach the age of seven we should be teaching them how to pray and if they are not praying regularly by the age of 10 then we should admonish them and punish them for that obviously teaching the children how to pray is very very important and most of us probably think by teaching the children how to pray it means teaching them how to make wudu what time of the prayers how to perform the prayers in terms of the actions but it is just as important brothers and sisters that we develop within children this inner dimension these inner aspects of worship the beautiful thing is that actually with kids it's not difficult to do at all children alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everybody upon the fitrah everybody every human being is naturally inclined in a sense to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is how Allah has created everybody and children of course by and large generally they are much closer to their fitrah because they are young they are innocent so it's very easy to get to develop within children the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's very easy to develop within the children the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's very easy to develop within children trust and hope and seeking forgiveness from Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a famous story of an imam who was trying to teach some children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something about Allah, and he gave each of them some money. And he said to the children, now all of you, go and hide and find a place where you can hide this money where no one can see you. So the children went running off in different places. One climbed a tree and hid it in the tree and another dug a hole in the ground and another one hid it in the cupboard in the house and they all found these really clever places to hide the money thinking that no one would be able to see it. But there was one boy who came with the coin still in his hand and he said, I couldn't find anywhere. So the Imam said, well, what do you mean you couldn't find anywhere? How could you not find somewhere where no one can see this coin? And this boy said, well, whenever I thought of somewhere to hide it, I realized that wherever it was, Allah could see it. So I'm sure you've heard this story in many different guises and many different forms. But the point here is how this Imam was teaching and educating the children about this very important aspect, this very important name and attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He sees everything. And there's nowhere where we can hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So actually, brothers and sisters, these things are really, really easy to teach children, and it's very, very important that we imbibe and we educate the children with these characteristics and that not only do we teach them the fiqh of wudu, the fiqh of salah, the fiqh of fasting and zakah and hajj, but also we teach them and inculcate in them these inner dimensions, these aspects of worship that should be going along with all of these ritualistic forms of worship that we are doing. So, Really, in reality, brothers and sisters, we need to begin now to be thinking about these inner dimensions as an intrinsic or a fundamental part of the correctness of the act of worship. In reality, we saw in the previous episode where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that establish the prayer for my remembrance that the very purpose of establishing prayer is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The very purpose of fasting Ramadan is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ so that you may acquire taqwa. So the result of all of these acts of worship is supposed to be an improvement in your inner condition, in the inward state of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, it's never really too young to try and imbibe within children these qualities and these characteristics, to teach them these things. And therefore, they will grow up with these things very, very naturally, alhamdulillah. So constantly remind children of the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of His uncountable bounties. And believe me, brothers and sisters, very soon and very quickly, those children will be full of love and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those numerous gifts and numerous bounties and numerous favors. Now, do you have to be an intellectual? Do you have to be an academic in order to comprehend and imbibe within yourself these inner dimensions of worship? Absolutely not. You certainly don't have to be. In fact, brothers and sisters, it may be that someone who is highly intellectual and highly academic, this whole aspect of the inner dimension of worship totally passes them by. We're reminded of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Jum'ah, in verse 5, the likeness of those who were charged with the Torah, then they did not observe it, is as the likeness of the donkey bearing books. So imagine this donkey carrying books. Do these books benefit the donkey? They may be carrying all of this knowledge. The mind is like that. The mind can carry lots of information. It can carry lots of knowledge. But if this knowledge is not being transformed into action, 
if you do not act upon it, if it does not make you humble and sincere and a person who loves Allah and fears Allah, then what is the point of all of this knowledge? What is the benefit of all of this knowledge? No, knowledge is there to be acted upon. So it's not necessary at all that you have to be an academic or an intellectual or a scholar in the sense of studying and reading lots of books. That's not essential at all. No, brothers and sisters, really, this type of knowledge is open to everyone. It is there for everyone. It is not belonging to any particular group or elite of people. In fact, in reality, subhanAllah, you can have two people. From the outside, everything about their prayer is the same. Everything about their hajj is the same. Everything seems to be the same between these two people. They're all following the procedures correctly. They're making all the right movements, saying all the right words. Yet between the prayer of this one and the prayer of that one, or the hajj of this one and the hajj of that one, it's like the distance between the heavens and the earth. A big, huge difference. And what is the difference? What makes that difference? What makes that difference is the inner dimension. What makes that difference is the sincerity, is the certainty, is the fear, the awe, the reverence, the love, the hope. So these are the things that make a difference between those acts of worship. So we'll take a short break now, brothers and sisters, and we'll be back with you very shortly, inshallah. Let's discuss issues. Welcome to Let's Talk. I'm your moderator. I'm your moderator. Omar Dunlap. Does Islam allow terrorism? This is unfair and this is not true. Not Dr. True. Mamdu Muhammad. It's Islam is the religion. Islam is peace, peace. Because of the media, because of what's said about Islam. Mahmoud Atiya. A huge amount of literature was written on the issue of what they call Islamic terrorism or fundamentalism is not a religious reason. It is a political. Sociological. Let's share ideas. Let's discover the truth. We need to put our hands together to show the mainstream the Islam, mainstream to, people. Islam to people. To clear doubts, discuss problems, and find proper conclusions. A unique and contemporary chat show. Let's talk tomorrow at 3 p.m. and repeat telecast at 1 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir, mother of all evils. According to the World Health Organization, every year, millions of people die due to the consumption of alcohol. My colleagues, the medical doctors, nowadays say that alcoholism is a disease. Therefore, we have to be sympathetic towards a sick alcoholic person. If alcoholism is indeed a disease, then it is the only disease that is sold in bottles. It is the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on radio broadcast stations, on television satellite channels. It is the only disease that has outlets licensed to legally spread it. It gets a revenue for the government. It is the only disease that causes violent deaths on the highways. It destroys family life and increases crime. It is the only disease that has no germs or viral cause. But our Creator, the Almighty says, in His last testament, the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maithru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, while ansabual aslam, dedication of stones, divination by arrows, rich summin amli shaitan, these are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fast and ibuhu, lallakum tuflihun, abstain from such abomination that you may prosper. Alcoholism is not a disease, it is Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper.
Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the second part of our discussion on who, where and when. Who is this knowledge for? The inner dimensions of worship. Where and when do we perform these acts of worship? So we've been discussing who. We've discussed that really as long as you're a Muslim and as long as you're following the five pillars it's pretty much for everybody and we discussed how important it is to imbibe these characteristics in our youth we showed how it's not necessarily that you need to be an academic or an intellectual or that you need to be highly educated but something that is worth pointing out is that education the right sort of education really can help. And that is because, brothers and sisters, I say the right sort of education, because the right sort of education is an Islamic education. Now, an Islamic education, in my understanding, is an educational environment where the subjects that you learn are constantly connected with the Qur'an. So if you are learning about astronomy, for example, you will also be referencing and reflecting upon the verses of the Qur'an. Similarly, if you are studying geography or oceanography, or you are studying anything about life, about history, then this education is constantly linked with the Qur'an. Now, a person who is educated like that, of course, will be able, insha'Allah, to reflect much more deeply on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has put in His creation. And this is one of the beautiful things about studying science from an Islamic perspective. Studying science from an Islamic perspective actually gives us more insight into how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates his creation. And one is even more amazed at the knowledge and the wisdom and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One also becomes amazed at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of even the most minute and subtle and small details of things. This is something that you get with education as long as it's an Islamic education. So the reason for studying science from the point of view of a Muslim is primarily for that, to help us to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to help us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more, insha'Allah. So I don't say that education in that sense is essential, but certainly education is very important. But it goes back to what I was talking about in a previous series, brothers and sisters, and that's the importance of contemplating, of deep thinking. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is telling us, look at the alternation of the night and the day. Well, that means look. It means look and think and contemplate and come to an understanding. And this is something very, very important. You know, None of this is going to come easily. It's all going to take hard work. So having discussed the type of person who this is for, we also need to understand and discuss some of the characteristics a person needs to have in order to be able to really benefit from and achieve this inner dimension of worship. So what you do need, brothers and sisters, is number one, you need commitment. This is something that needs commitment. It needs commitment and it needs discipline and it needs practice because there are no real shortcuts. You become good at something because you put an effort into it and you concentrate and you practice and practice and practice and you keep on trying to improve yourself. So there is no shortcut here. 
There is no shortcut to achieving that inner state of being. It is something that takes that discipline, it takes that commitment, it takes that effort, and it takes that practice. Indeed, it's a jihad. A jihad means a struggle to the utmost of your ability. Yes, it is jihad bil nafs. This is the struggle against yourself. This is what it is about. And it is a struggle. It is a battle, brothers and sisters. That's the reality. It's like that. So it does take commitment, it does take discipline, it does take effort. But mashallah, if you give it that effort, you have that discipline and commitment, and you have that patience, you will see the benefits, you will see the fruits, you will see the results, and they will be truly momentous, truly fantastic. And that's something I'm going to be talking about towards the end of my series. I'm going to be talking about happiness, true happiness. I don't mean artificial happiness, you know, the way most people think of happiness, maybe they think of, you know, having a nice house, having a nice car, money, you know, children, wife. They think of happiness like this. No. What I'm talking about is a true and deep and profound sense of happiness. A sense of happiness that does not depend upon externalities. A sense of happiness that is rooted inside the way that you think. And once you have learned to develop this inner dimension, and you combine this inner dimension with your outer ritualistic acts of worship, you will find that that type of personality, that type of truly happy, successful personality, they call it sometimes autotelic, which means that you rely upon what's inside yourself for happiness. This is one of the most exciting and positive results that you will get from spending the time and effort that is needed on this inner dimension. And inshallah, that's something that I plan to be finishing up and rounding up the whole series with a discussion about that psychological state, that spiritual state that we achieve when, alhamdulillah, we invest our time, we invest our effort into these inner dimensions of worship. So, the other qualities that are very, very desperately needed, brothers and sisters, are patience, and patience is needed in abundance, and humility. Yes, humility, brothers and sisters. This is very important. Humility, realizing one of the things you need to realize is you can't do this on your own. You need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're all of us limited, finite, needy human beings. The beautiful thing as well about this is that you will learn humility from the point of view is that how do you know what is the condition of the person standing next to you? By and large, you don't. You don't know what's going on inside the person next to you. You, mashallah, may think that you have achieved a state of reverence and awe in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khushur. But how do you know the person next to you has not even reached that on an even higher level? You don't know. So you need humility, brothers and sisters, and that's a very important dimension in every Muslim, alhamdulillah. Now, we want to finish off by talking about when. When do we do this? Now, obviously, in an ideal condition, we would walk around constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constantly connected to Allah in a state of constant attentiveness. But in reality, that is not something that we will achieve most of the time. In fact, it's very interesting that there was a companion of the Prophet, his name was Hanzalah. And one day he was listening to a speech of the Prophet and he went home to his family. And when he went back to his family, he realized that his state had changed. He was with the Prophet and when he was with the Prophet, he felt as if the paradise, the hellfire, the day of judgment, as if it was real in front of him. And then when he went to his family, he forgot. So he started thinking he was a hypocrite. And he started saying, Hanzal is a hypocrite, Hanzal is a hypocrite. And he was walking around saying that. And then he met Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr said, what are you saying, Hanzala? And then he told Abu Bakr what happens to him. He said, you know, when I'm with the Prophet, I feel like this and that. And then when I go to my family, I forget everything. 
Abu Bakr said, by Allah, the same thing happens to me. Let's go and ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet said, Oh Hanzala, if you were able to stay in the same state when you were with your family as you are with me, in other words, if you were able to be in that condition, when you're with your family, if you were still like the way you are with me, the Prophet said, the angels will come down and shake hands with you in the street. But there is a time for this and a time for that. There is a time for this and a time for that. And a time for this and a time for that. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying that each time, each situation has its circumstance. So by and large, brothers and sisters, the time that you need to spend when is those times when you are doing the ritual acts of worship during the Salah, when you're giving Zakah, when you're fasting Ramadan, when you're making Hajj, these are the times to really focus strongly on these inner dimensions and then inshallah it will spread to the other aspects of your life bi-idhnillah. May Allah give us the good success in this life and the next. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Allahu Ya Rabbi Ya Allah Allahu Ya Rabbi Ya Allah